of applause for the anointing and the power that flows through the worship team. Hallelujah. I just want y'all to know that that's what it looks like when you don't quit. See, Pastor Matt and Robert and them shared with me about how when they first started this church, they used to listen to tapes. And that's how they worshiped the Lord, through tapes. And you know what? They didn't quit. They didn't say, well, that church doesn't have a band, and we're just not going to go there. They trusted the Lord, and the Lord provided instruments with no musicians. And they said, okay, well, we're going to purchase. And I'm saying this because I'm, I'm going to talk about this today. I want to talk to you about waiting on the Lord. The title of my message is Wait on the Lord. And one of the things the Lord did with them is told Robert and them to buy drums and instruments and all these things, and they didn't have any musicians to use them. But slowly, as they waited, as they trusted, as they did not get discouraged, and I'm sure it was probably up and down as, as, as we go through trials, you, you don't understand and you're waiting and you're waiting. But then God provided a musician here and a musician there and this and that. And then he decided to bring my dad and mom all the way from New Jersey and bring them here and say, okay, I'm going to send your daughter first and let her get settled. And then I'm going to send y'all out there too. See, God is not a respecter of persons. He wants, and look, he brought Micah back. Micah left and then she came back. Praise God. Okay, because he said, I want to use you. I want to use you. I want to use you. See, God's plan, it doesn't return void because we, we maybe failed or messed up or whatever the case may be, or maybe we took a detour, or maybe it was his plan all along. But God will get you where he wants to get you, and he will keep you where he wants to keep you. And you know what? In it, you might feel like you're dying. And you can be like, well, how can that be God? <laughs> because God wants to do something in you that's greater than you. Amen. And he wants to change you. And he knows how to orchestrate this situation to get whatever is in you out. So he could put more of him in you. Okay. And that could be a painful process. But when you get to where God wants you to be, his glory will be revealed. Because that thing that has been bothering you or hindering you or troubling you, he will remove it and he will give you power to overcome it. And then he will give you peace like never before. And the thing is, is God wants to change you into his image more and more and more. Yeah. It was never about you to begin with. <laughs> it was always about him. I'm sorry. We live in a society that is me, 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 me. What can I get? How can I be? What can I look like? What a, me, me. Do you see me? But God is saying, no, <laughs> I want them to see me. I want them to see me. So the title of my message is wait upon the Lord. And you know what? I want to, Sabrina, God has changed you and used you so your girls could see him. And you have been broken and I have walked beside you. But that, Gabby stands and then Cameron comes and then the other girl comes and she I never seen her before so I don't know but it's like that's what it's about y'all it's about the kingdom of God it's about the glory of God it's about one person showing one person showing one person I mean what's Robert what's your friend's name in the in the peach Robert oh Robert and Robert Robert I've met you a couple times. I've seen you a couple times, but you weren't really here when I was here a lot. But you know what I've seen about you? Every time you're here, you're pulling people to the altar. Every time I see you, you're bringing them to the altar and you're saying, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. I love that because he's saying, let me show you the glory of God. 
God. God has something different for you. Y'all keep going, keep growing, keep doing what you're doing. Don't allow the weight to discourage you. Okay, because you have the weight. There's a weight. And the weight is hard. The weight can be lonely. The weight can be isolating. It can be hard. Let me read the scripture before I get ahead of myself. Isaiah 40, 28. Isaiah 40, 28 says this. Has thou not known? God opens with a question. Has thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, meaning covenant-keeping God, the creator of the ends of the earth, he, he, he opens up with a question, and then he says, this is who I am. I am the everlasting God. I am the covenant-keeping God. I am the creator of the ends of the earth. I fainteth not, and I weary not. There is no searching of his understanding. Stop trying to figure it out. You'll drive yourself insane. Trust him where he planted you, where he put you. He says, listen, he gives power to the faint. Have you felt fatigue? Have you been weary in the battle? Have you felt like you just don't understand? You just don't know how to get ahead. I just don't know what to do. I am faint. He said, I will give you power. And to them that have no might, no might, you can't even get up in the morning. Can't even lift your head off the pillow. I have cried for days upon days. David said, I have wept and the pillow upon my couch is soaked. David, the king, the man after God's own heart said, I have wept and I have wept. I have no strength left. And the, and the Bible says this, he will increase strength. Even the youth shall faint. You know, the zealous, them who just get saved, the youth, those who are like, yes, we're going to do God's work. We're going to do the kingdom of God. And you know what? Zeal is good, but God is going to mature you. God is going to mature me. And growing pains hurt. Because he wants mature believers. He wants zeal with maturity. And he wants to temper that. So he says, even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall other, utterly fail. Those that are even in good shape, those that have good jobs, those that are, that everything will fail. And he said, but they that wait. Y'all, we live in a society, and, and I'm from New Jersey, and everything is fast-paced. We don't want to wait. We want to make it happen. <laughs> we want to get something done. We want to pray one time and see God move in five minutes. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. We are a microwave meal society. We are drive through society. We are drive through get it done, thank you, one, two, three, got my meal, and here we go. Off to the next thing. But God is saying, but they that wait... They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. See, we need a renewing. We need a renewing. What, what we were doing this morning in worship, if you were not used to it, it's a tarrying. It's a pressing. It's a believing. See, a lot of churches and churches today want to go from song to song to song and then the word and then they're out the door to lunch. But you know what? In the, in the olden days, in the book of Acts, they were not thinking about that. When Jesus was there and showing up in their midst and he was teaching to them, I highly doubt 
they even cared about anything else but what the Messiah was saying. And that's what I wanted this morning. We should only care about one thing. What is the Messiah saying to me? What do I need to get this morning? What does he want to show me this morning? What does he want to teach me this morning? What have I been going through that he wants to reveal to me this morning? I don't know about you, but I need some questions answered. I need, and if he doesn't answer your question, you got to trust him anyway. Peter said, where should I go? There's nowhere else. You hold the words of life. A lot of disciples walked away. But Peter said, there is no, listen, there is nowhere else to go. (laughs) Jesus is it and that's all. Signed, sealed, delivered. So settle that in your heart this morning. That that's it, he's the answer. And he said, I'll renew their strength. That's what God was doing this morning. He was renewing our strength in worship. Look, I had a hard morning. And I have to stand up here and preach. And it's hard when you go through something right before you got to go preach. But I said, God, I am here in your presence. I am your messenger. I want the people to get what you have placed in my heart. And I'm not going to quit. Do you know how many times how easy it is to say I'm not going? I'm not going to church this morning. I'm not sitting with the Lord this morning. Y'all ever been so angry with the Lord? Look, don't put your halos on. And so not understanding that you're like, I don't need to read that word. I don't, I don't, I don't need to. I don't want you to pray for me. Don't pray for me. Don't put your, don't put your hand on me. I've done that with Naya. <laughs> Naya will be coming with the scripture. And I say, stop preaching to me. I know the word. I don't need you to preach the word to me. Y'all ever feel like that before? You know, your friends are like, and trying to encourage you and like, girl, it's going to be okay. Wait on the Lord. He'll renew your strength. And you're like, shut up. Right? You say, because it's agitating your spirit because you know why? It's true. It's true. It's true. And our flesh doesn't want to hear it. We don't want to hear the truth. So then all you can do for them people is pray. I told Niall one time, I don't listen to anybody else. I only listen to the Holy Ghost. And she said, okay, I'm going to pray the Holy Ghost speak to you exactly what I just said. (laughs) And now my husband does the same thing. He said, oh, you don't listen to nobody but the Holy Ghost. I'm going to pray the Holy Ghost speak to you. And he's faithful. (laughs) He's faithful. God is faithful. And he will speak to me. And he said, so do what they just said. (laughs) Do what they just said. Hallelujah. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up. He's about to mount you up this morning on wings like eagles. Eagles wings. He's going to soar you above your circumstance. That doesn't mean it's going to go away. That means he's going to give you strength to overcome. You're in the process. See, there's a moment that you get saved and of salvation and you give your heart to the Lord and you say, okay, Lord, where I want to do this. I love you. I repent of my sin. I just want what you have for me. But from the promise, there is a process that we need to walk through till the moment that God comes back and gives us glorified bodies and we go to meet him in the air. And I can't wait for that day. I look forward to that day that we get our glorified bodies and we're with Jesus ruling and reigning in the new heaven and the new earth. Aren't you excited about that? I'm excited about that. But for now, you're stuck with each other. And we're stuck here on earth. But he says, I have a work for you to do here on earth. And while you're on earth, I put a new heart and a new spirit in you. I have sealed you, he said. I have given you an earnest. I have given you a down payment of my spirit. 
So the moment of salvation, he takes you and places you in Christ and implants his spirit in your heart and he gives you a new heart, a heart that can recognize God, a heart that can understand his word, a heart that can be opened up. Your eyes are opened up spiritually to the things of God and the things of this world. He gives you discernment and he says, okay, I have equipped you. I have given you my word. I have given you my spirit. And now I want you to walk. But you know what? A baby's got to learn how to crawl. How about, how about roll over? <laughs> sit up. Sit the head up. Drink milk. You can't give a baby steak. So there's a process. So look, do not despise small beginnings and mature Christians don't you dare God let us not dare look at a baby Christian someone who just got saved and expect them to be somewhere that they're not God help us help us help us to, to discern and to be kind and to be long suffering that means suffer long. It's good, it's right. Remain under the trial until the change happens, until the promise happens, until I come and I meet you there. Man, the day that I see things that I've been praying for happen, I'm not just talking about in my own life. I'm talking about in other people's lives. I'm talking about that when I've been tarrying in the closet, Sierra, to see you come to this altar, girlfriend, that right there, when I've been seeking God to see some things happen within other people's lives, to see my dad stand up here and play the bass for Jesus, when I've been praying and tearing in the closet, Michelle, to see you come back in the doors and worship the Lord, because God has a call on your life, when I've been tearing to see people change and God glorified in their life, when I see see that? I hate to put y'all out there, but I'm telling you, God said, pray in secret and I will reward you openly. But that's not always about you. Bridget, you've been praying for your children. You've been praying for your children and your children are coming to the Lord. You're seeing it before your eyes. You're seeing your grandbabies be taught of God. That is exciting. God is doing something in our midst. But you know what? If we quit in the waiting, we're not going to see it. Don't quit in the waiting. God knows the perfect time. He knows. And look, sometimes we, we like to think we're God. And in the waiting, but God, I have done. But look, this was me. I, I just put myself out there. Because I... In waiting, I would be like, God, but I have been faithful to you. That is a self-righteous attitude. God, I've been faithful to you. Why haven't you done it yet? I haven't done it yet because it's not time yet. God, I have been, I have, I have done, I have labored, I have prayed. He doesn't do things because you've done. He does things because you believe. But God's timing always matters. See, let me tell you something about me and my husband. We've talked about this before. If God would have put us together any sooner, we would have been in big trouble. And we probably wouldn't have liked each other. Not at all. Because the work that God had to do in our lives and in our hearts had to be done before he brought us together. Before he puts you in that position. Before he moves you here or moves you there. There is a work and a maturity in your life that has to be done. So that you can handle what God is bringing you to. And that you can handle it in love and care. That you can handle it in maturity. That you can handle your family the way that he's asking you to handle them. And God says, look, I want you to wait. But look, in the waiting, that doesn't mean sit down. That doesn't mean throw in the white flag. That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean just like begrudgingly. Y'all ever throw a fit with the Lord? I have thrown some tantrums with God. 
And like, you ever see like a two-year-old on the ground, like kicking and screaming, like, yeah, that was me. <laughs> yep. And if, if you say you haven't done that, I think you might be lying. <laughs> I'm just saying, this is the house of God. And he said, wait. And that waiting means to bind together. So check this out. In the, in the waiting period, he is, that word also means twisting. He is making you and him one. He is causing you and Jesus to become one. You, you want to know why you feel isolated? Because he's causing you and him to become one. You want to know why your spouse can't help you and your children can't help you and your best friend can't help you and your pastor can't help you? All they can do is encourage you because there's a twisting and a binding together and making you one. There's a maturity. There's a tarrying. There's a waiting that's happening. Waiting means to stay where you are even in a delay of action until something happens. We like to quit in the delay. There's only two things you could do when God tells you to wait. And one is to allow that process to happen. And the other I have experienced is to become bitter, resentful, complaining, accusatory, pointing the finger, at other people and getting hard towards the Lord. There's only one or two ways. Can't go. There's no middle, middle ground, middle line. He said, look, in the waiting, I want you to trust me. I want you to stay. I want you to remain. I want you to pause for a second until I move. I want you to look forward with expectancy, with anticip anticipation. Like you, Christmas morning, when the kids know that there's going to be presence in the house. There's a, there's, a, there's a preparation that takes place. You hang up this, you hang up that, you go shopping, you do all these different things. You prepare for that morning where you're going to have Christmas with your family. You know that all those fuzzy, warm feelings you get when you're preparing for Christmas morning? Well, that's, that's what he's saying. He's like, look, I'm preparing you in the wait. For the day when I move, and when I move, it's going to be greater than you could ever imagine. He's saying, I need you to trust me in the wait. I need you to be patient in the wait. And don't get hard in the wait. Don't begrudge me in the wait. Don't allow yourself to be bitter and resentful towards those around you and towards me in the wait. He said, because I'm not just causing you to wait because it, I want, cause it's painful. I want you to wait because I want you to get ready. I want you to prepare. I want to prepare you. And not only that, but I want you to know me. Know me. Get to know me in the wait. Amen. And he said, when you wait, when you wait with hope, you will not grow weary. You will walk and you will not faint because God is going to give you the power in the wait. And you know what all else? When he teaches you that in the wait, when that next big thing comes up, because bet your bottom dollar, whatever it is, it's coming again. Look, you can't live off experience. You can't live off of the experience of Sunday morning. You can't live off the experience of Wednesday night. You can't live off of one experience with God. He, they wanted to, to build tents on the top of the mountain and plant themselves there. And God said, no, I don't want you to stay here because there's a, another experience. There's another move that I want you to experience. And we shouldn't be living for just for the move of God. We should be living for him every single day of our lives. He wants us to see him every single day of our lives. And he says, I want you to wait. I want you to have hope and anticipate and look forward to my coming. And during that, I'm going to teach you something. So when that big thing comes up again, you can soar above it with power. 
You can soar above it with power. That thing has no hold on you. That thing is dead to you because Devin, you are dead and you are hidden in Christ, in God. That thing has no power over you anymore. Laura, that thing is dead. It is cut off. It has no assignment against you any longer. It is expired. It is done. It is done away with. It is finished. And that's what we need to believe when that thing shows up again, whether it be an outward circumstance or an inward bent that your heart begins to go to God says no I have given you power power of sin has been done away with over your life see that's what a victorious life looks like when that thing begins to hang over your head when guilt and shame become the verdict and it says you are guilty and my Bible says you are not guilty Mike see condemnation will weigh over you that's a verdict but God's penalty has already been paid by the blood of Jesus. He says your debt has already been satisfied. Jesus paid your debt, not just for you to get to heaven, but so you could live victoriously on this earth. So you can live in the fullness of what God has for you. He said, but I want you to wait. Wait from the promise. There's a moment that God promises you something, and then there's a fulfillment of that promise. But if we quit, we might not see the fulfillment of that promise. But if we wait, and look, I'm telling y'all, the wait is painful. It is. I'm not even going to, like, fluff it up. <laughs> there's no fluffing. <laughs> Jesus died on Calvary. <laughs> For us, that we could have power to walk through the way. The outline of this book, real quick, I just want you to see a couple things, is God, in chapters 1 through 12, God knows his people's sin, but he calls them back to himself. Listen, God sees all. He knows all. He knows every height, every depth. He knows when you wake. He knows when you lie down. He knows your thoughts. I mean, I heard Paul Washer say one time if he were to put everybody's thoughts on the board, we would be quite ashamed of what goes on that board. See, but God said we can even sin in our thought process. Our eyes can betray us and deceive us. Our heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Who can know it? But God says, I see my people sin, but I'm calling them to myself. See, it's not intimidating for God. See, when we see our sin and we want to hide, it's because of our pride. It's because we think we should have done better. Or we, sh we think we should be somewhere that we're not. <laughs> or, or we think that we should be better than we are. Or we thought we were better than we were. But God says, hey... <laughs> That thing's still there. I still want to deal with that thing. I still need to remove some of that thing. I still want in that room in your heart. I still want to rearrange some things in your life. I still want to change this thinking and thought process about you. I still want to do this work in your heart. And he says, okay, look, there's your sin, but I'm calling you to forgiveness. And you know what? During that time, people, time period, some of them received it and some of them refused it. And I want to tell you this. God is calling his people back to himself, and some of us will receive it, and some of us will refuse it. God says when he comes back, that he's coming back for his people, and 10 virgins, five of them were ready, and five of them were not. So if you look at that as in the scope of this room, you have to be prepared, and you have to be ready, and that doesn't mean you have to be perfect, praise God. <laughs> that, that means that you have to be having a continuous relationship with the Lord through faith and grace, through faith and grace. And some refused and some drew away in their own pride and they wanted to do their own thing, but some received and wanted God to move. Chapters 13 through 23 were God's sovereignty over the nations. What does God's sovereignty mean? God is in absolute power. He is absolute is supreme being. He is absolute power. He is in control of all things. Well, how can be he be in control when evil is waxing worse and worse? The Bible says 
that this would happen. He is very clear in his word what is going to happen in the nation. But in the end, it is to draw his people back to himself. So don't get discouraged in the wait. Because what he is doing is he is drawing his people by his supreme knowledge and power And he is cultivating a people that will love him and walk with him. So these people at this time, they either acknowledged him or they rejected him. And if we reject the light, we will go into a downward spiral. It will get worse and worse. If you allow sin into your life and reject the conviction of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit convicts. It's one of the things, the lovely things about the Holy Spirit is that he convicts of righteousness and judgment to come. He convicts you of your sin. And when he convicts you, it's not to make you feel condemned. He convicts you to turn you back to him. He said, hey, I want you to come in this direction. That's off the path. Hey, I don't want you to speak like that. Hey, I don't. You know, what you just said could have made them stumble. You need to be quiet. You don't know. So you don't know. And look, that's good. (laughs) I used to get really irritated with the Holy Spirit. I'm just being honest, if I could be honest. I used to be really irritated. I I would be like, could you stop talking to me? (laughs) Everything I do is wrong. Y'all know what I'm talking about. But that's because God was cleaning me up. He was clean. Robert, you go and fish. Got all them fish, but you got to clean them. You got to gut them. You got to get to the good stuff. And that's what God is doing with his people. He's cleaning up the sheep. He's cleaning up the fish so he could get to the good part. So we could get to where the glory of God could shine through us. But he's got to do with the work. And the work happens in the waiting. So he's, look, this is my sovereignty. This is my plan. I knew my people were going to sin. I knew they were going to refuse me. I knew they were going to turn their back. I knew you were going to fall down. I knew you were going to go that way. I knew that you were going to do that. And I'm still loving you. I'm still calling you. My flesh was still torn for you. I knew you weren't going to understand. And that is okay. Trust my plan, though. And then God, in through 24 through 27, God triumphs over evil and delivers his people. That word triumph, there was a shout this morning. And don't let the enemy take that shout. We're going to be shouting out that door this morning. Because don't let, look, God said, I will triumph. That means, means I will give you the victory. I have a military force that has conquest. I have obtained victory. I have prevailed. There was a victory ceremony going on, triumphing over the enemy. See, the cross of Christ. I know sometimes we get tired of hearing about the cross, but don't ever get tired of hearing about the cross because the cross of Christ has triumphed over the enemy. The enemy cannot prevail because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And you can walk in that. You can walk in that every day of your life. And the cross, the blood. So the prophet Isaiah was looking forward. He was saying, look, my people are, he knew God revealed to him that his, that God's people were about to be in captivity to the Assyrians and to the Babylonians. And he said, look, my people are about to be in captivity. Have you ever been in your walk in the Lord and been captive by something? Something that was not of God? Something that has stolen your attention? Has stolen your affection? Has stolen your mind? You're completely engaged in this other thing and God is calling you out. And he's like, look, you're gonna become captive. I know it. But I have provided a way of you escape. I have provided a triumph over evil. I have provided a way. And I want you to look forward with hope. 
Hope and expectancy that the time you walked into my presence, the way that you did, you shall not leave my presence the way that you walked in because I have done something by my blood that you can look forward to with hope and expectancy that I am a God that I shall not lie and I shall come through. I shall come through. God isn't like man. He doesn't say he wants to take you on a date and not show up. He doesn't say he's going to do something and not do it. When God speaks, it happens. When God speaks, mountains move. When God speaks, Lazarus comes out the grave. When God speaks, grave clothes come off. When God speaks, red seas open and the enemy is triumphed over. When God speaks, Jordans open up. When God speaks, Hannah has a baby that is for the kingdom and the glory of God. When God speaks, our blinded eyes are open and deaf ears are unstopped. When God speaks, it happens. You can hold on to that truth. God's word does not return void. Ever. My mom waited to see me saved for years. And I put her through hell. And I I did. And she waited. And she waited. And she held on. And she held on. and And what if she didn't wait? What if she didn't tarry? I don't know where I would be. I'd probably be dead. If I could be honest. But she waited, and for 12 years now, I've been with going on 13, I've been walking with the Lord, and I have been clean, and I have been saved, and I have been kept by the power of God. I have not been perfect. Ask Naya, or my husband, or my mom. I have not been perfect, but God didn't call me to be perfect. He didn't call you to be perfect. He called you to be perfected. And in the process, you're being perfected. Don't get discouraged. You're sitting in these chairs. That means you want something from the Lord. That means you desire to know him. That means you want what he has for you. And we might not understand it all. But then he said this, In the next chapters, right before our verses, he says, I sent my word for a confused people. The word of God, the truth of his word. If you feel perplexed, have you ever felt disoriented before? And I don't even mean just in the natural, but just disoriented in your walk. Like you don't, you don't understand what's going on. And, and you've been giving it your all. Maybe you've been doing everything I've been saying. Maybe you've been praying and you've been sitting with the Lord and you've been believing God. And you've been trusting him. But everything seems a mess. It just seems disoriented. It seems like you are perplexed on every side. And it says, I sent my word for a confused people so that they could know their identity who they are. See, our identity can be found in many things. I'm a personal trainer, and I see a lot of people's identity be found in their body, their body type. I see a lot of people's identity be found in power or prestige, what kind of car they drive, what kind of house they have, what kind of job they have. I see a lot of people's identity be found in their ability Like, Naya is an amazing worship leader, but what makes her amazing worship leader is not her talent, it's the anointing. And the anointing comes from her relationship with the Lord. Same for any other worship leader. But she could have taken that talent, tried to make it big, and do whatever, and found her identity in that. But God said, I want you to find your identity in me. I want you to find your identity in my word, who I've called you to be. Who did God call us to be? And you know what? In every season, you could be called to be something different. 
Like, I wasn't a wife before, and now I'm a wife. And, oh, God, I got to figure that one out. (laughs) There's a lot of death going on in here. (laughs) Figure out how to love somebody unconditionally. Figure out how to be a mother or a father and love your children unconditionally. Figure out how to go into the new position and be a good worker The Bible says that we should work unto the Lord. Look, your boss might be vicious. Robert is not that boss. He's a good boss. But you go into your job and you do it unto the Lord. But there's a process of waiting that takes place while you're going through the trial that God wants to renew your strength. Danielle, I know. Danielle is one of my bestest friends, y'all, from Bible college. She's a powerful woman of God. But I know that, Danielle, you've been waiting for things. And I know that you want to see them come to pass, but you haven't quit, girlfriend. We might have cried many tears. And we might have shouted and screamed the walls down. And and we might have been bitter at times. See, it's the process. (laughs) One moment you could be excited. Next moment you could be crying. The next moment you could be screaming. The next moment you could be angry. And then you're back to victorious. That's just the way it goes, y'all. But God says, I want to do a continuous work in you. See, I want you to go from shouting in my presence to crying in my presence. And then I want to remove that area where you got bitter. I want to remove that area where you're looking at me twisted, the Lord said. (laughs) We look at the Lord twisted. (laughs) Look, don't, look, I'm telling you, don't. The best thing for us to do is what Jacob did when he went before the Lord. He wrestled with the Lord, and it wasn't until the moment he acknowledged that he was a deceiver that God could change him. God might have crippled you during this season. That thorn, that thing that has been bothering you is meant to cripple you, to get you to acknowledge, I need to change. Something's got to go. I got to acknowledge this thing. I got to acknowledge that I might not talk to people the way that I should talk. To people, I might. I need to acknowledge that I haven't been as sacrificial towards someone that I need to be sacrificial towards. I might need to put their needs above my needs. I, I might need to go into the church house and wipe that smug look off of my face. And I might need to go hug some necks and be kind to some people in the church because this bitterness has got me so bound up that I can't even get close to anybody because that resentment comes out when I'm around them. No, I'm talking about stuff going on in your own heart. That we walk into the church house and be giving everybody else a crooked look. Naya did not hit that note today. She did not bring me in the way that she should have. Well, you better learn how to get in yourself. Look, for real, when I'm in my car, Naya ain't there. When I'm going through the trial, Naya isn't there. She tries to be there as much as she can. But you better hit that note yourself. And look, I'm the worst singer in the whole world. All my family musicians, my husband a musician, and then they put me in there. But I will worship the Lord, (laughs) and you will hear me. And I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. So let me tell you, when you walk in this house, don't you mind who's next to you? You go in. You shout. You clap. You make a joyful noise to the Lord. And he will renew your strength. Get a little step in there. It won't hurt you. It will loosen you up a little bit. God wants a living church. He wants a revived church. And he wants us to be in numbers. I mean, Aaron, thank you for your prayers. Because I walked into the prayer meeting today, and I needed it. 
I needed it. And all I seen was Aaron praying. He just like this, big old arms, just like this. And I was like, yes, I need some of that. I need where he's going. And guess what? You can do that too. In this house, we need each other. I needed you to be here, Laura. That's why I texted you yesterday. I needed to see your pretty face. I need, we need each other. I need to hear Sabrina weeping at the altar. If that makes you uncomfortable, oh well. Amen. Hannah wept at the altar and God heard her cry. Now look, if you're quiet, that's okay too. I'm mad at you. Just make sure you're getting it. Make sure you're right here getting it. Make sure you're not shutting everybody off. I want to hear Danielle praying the kingdom of God down in tongues. You might not understand that either. And guess what? That's okay. God is not intimidated by our lack of understanding. But I'll tell you one thing. This is what I used to tell the Lord. Lord, whatever you have for me, whatever is in your word for a confused people, for disoriented people, for your people that are perplexed, I want it. So let me tell you, if God would have told me to eat peanut butter and gargle it upside down, I would have. Because I was so sick and tired of living the way that I was. I was so sick and tired. You know that phrase in NA and A, sick and tired and sick and tired? You stop being sick. You won't get help until you're sick and tired. Well, I was sick and tired. But I didn't need help from that. I needed help from the Lord. I needed help. I needed power that was greater than myself because that thing was overcoming me de morning, noon, and night. And just because we're children of God doesn't mean the enemy stops. You actually have a target on your back. He coming for you harder. And he knows exactly how to get you. And he, and, but see, in the waiting, he's got the perfect setup plan because he speaks to you in the waiting. He speaks to you. Hey, God, God doesn't hear your prayer. He only answers Pastor Matt's prayers. <laughs> you don't worship like her. God doesn't see your worship. You don't have any gifts that God wants to use you for. Do you remember where you came from? Just speaking to you. Speaking to you in the waiting. And God said, no, I want to renew your fatigue where you have been tired. I'm about to come renew you. I'm about to come renew you. I want to renew you. Where you have been weak, I want to renew you. In the beginning of the chapter, he says this. He says this. He says, Isaiah 41, if you want to put that up on the board. He says this. He says, comfort you. Comfort you, my people, saith God. When God says something twice, it's an emphatic statement. It means he wants you to understand this and he wants you to do this. Where can you find comfort? In the word of God, in the presence of God. Look, God has equipped us with all that we need and sometimes we just don't use it. I have found, and I told you this last time I was here, I have found myself being so busy at times that I like, I just run out the door and I miss my moment with the Lord when all I had to do was open up the word and said, if I ascend into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the other parts of the sea, thou art there. Even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand of power shall hold me up. I needed to hear that. And you know what? You know what that does? It revitalizes your strength. You are there. In the, if I make my bed in hell, you are there. If I make my bed in heaven, you are there. Your right hand of power shall hold me up. I mean, doesn't that get you? You excited that should excite you the word of God is living it's sharper than any two-edged sword listen don't go in the Bible Naya's mom taught me a very important lesson as I was growing up in the Lord and she said if you don't understand what you're reading keep reading because there's a lot of times you go through the Bible and the art thou and you know you got like six thousand names in one one um, chapter and you're like and you can't even pronounce them and you're like look and I do a good scan of those you know and I keep moving on but you know what 
God in his sovereignty and in his power in the heat of the trial and you're in hell, so to say, will begin to speak if you make your bed in hell, I am there. If you ascend into heaven, I am there. My right hand of power shall hold you up. Like you'll begin to hear it in your heart. But you want to know why? Because you put it there when you read it. And the word of God says that he shall bring it back to remembrance. That's why it's important to read your word yourself. That's why it's important to get in your prayer closet yourself. Well, I don't know how to pray. These people, they're and they're all over the place and they're screaming, I don't know how to pray. You know what the Lord hears? Help. Peter. Peter said, help. I'm sinking. Help. It's okay. It's okay to not have all eloquent words. He's not looking at your eloquency. He's looking at your heart. I mean, for Gabby lays hands on people and they get filled with the Holy Ghost. She didn't go to school for that. She didn't sit through doctoring class for that. She sat at Crossway Ministry in that Sunday school room at that youth group and under her mama. And now... She just says, I just believe <laughs> they're going to get filled with the Holy Ghost. And Gabby is, people are getting filled with the Holy Ghost. I mean, so you don't have to have all these things, I'm saying. Because so many times we walk in this church and we're just like, we don't have it all together. Well, good. You're in a great place. Because God now can say, well, you're fatigued enough where I can renew your strength. Because you've been trying to do it all in yourself. And I have seen your efforts. And I haven't turned a deaf ear. But today is the day where we can surrender to the Lord. And you can comfort yourself, oh my people. Comfort yourself in the Lord. Comfort yourself in what I'm going to do for you. In, in their distressed hearts. God said, I have not lost sight of you. I have not lost sight of your cry. I know you've been waiting a long time to see it come to pass. And I have seen you in your waiting. I have seen you in your confusion. I have seen you in your distress. But I ask myself this, isn't it the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom of heaven? That's what the word says. We either believe it or we don't. We either receive it or we don't. The word also says this. Behold the sparrows of the air. For they neither sow nor they reap nor they gather in a barns. But the heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Say I, God doesn't see me. I don't know where he is. But isn't his eye on the sparrow? Doesn't he watch over you? How much if he feeds the sparrows of the air would he not take care of his children? I mean, so many times the enemy sows this discord in our hearts towards the Lord. Listen, I'm going through something right now that I have been like, God, I don't understand. And it's painful, like gut-wrenching. And it's just me and the Lord. Does it have anything to do with my husband or anything to do with kids or anything to do with anything? This is something between me and God. And I have been, look, my eye has been twisted towards people. My, I'm, tell, I'm just telling you the truth. Not y'all. My eye has been twisted towards God. It has gotten me to question in confusion of like, did I make the right decisions? Did I do the right things? Because this don't look good. And it doesn't feel good. And God said, you got to wait. And we hate that. We, but delay is not denial. Delay is not denial. D delay, in the delay, he's just getting you ready. He's just getting you ready. And then he says this in Matthew 6, 27. Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit to his stature? Which of you by worrying? Anybody worry in here? Never. Don't worry. I trust the Lord. But you know what? Worrying can be overpowering. When you have a child that's wayward, when you have family members that have seen you fail maybe, or a church, or maybe you're just going through something or you're worrying, there's something at, in your bank account, 
There's something that's been going on that's just been worrying you to death. And it will worry you to death. And God says, is that beneficial to you? Like, how, how by worrying can you change anything? You can't change anything by worrying. Don't I take care of the sparrows? Won't I take care of you? So in, I'm saying all these things to remind you, in the waiting, there is warfare. In the waiting, the Bible says this, Isaiah 42, Speak you comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her. Listen, I want you all to hear this. That her warfare is, a, is accomplished. Listen. And her iniquity is pardoned. For she saith, have receiveth of the Lord's hand double for her sins. He was saying, Isaiah, I want you to cry. I want you to call out. I want you to bid come my church. I want you to call out to Jerusalem. I want you to call out. The Spirit of God is calling out to his church. And he is saying this. Your warfare is accomplished. He's saying the battle, the hardship, the war which you have been facing, my people, my bride, my church, it has been come to an end. It is accomplished. It is expired. It is finished. It is done away with. Stop fighting it. Stop warring. The war that we have is in the spirit. The good fight of faith is the war that we should be fighting. But you can't muster up to accomplish anything that God wants to accomplish in your life. You can't change him. You can't change her. And you can't change you. You can only allow God to change you. And so what our war is, is to believe that our warfare has been accomplished, that our battle has been expired, that our hardship is finished. That's the battle. So God says, speak to my people and tell them that it has been done and their iniquity has been pardoned. I don't know who needs to hear that this morning, but your sin is forgiven. Your sin is forgiven. Your, do you hear me this morning? Your sin is forgiven. Your struggle is forgiven. Your sin is done away with. It is cast from the east into the west. And the only people that can bring it up is you, the devil, and other people. And they're all liars. Because my Bible says... That my sin is cast from the east, is from the west, and I am justified, and I am right with God because of the blood of Jesus. And his word says, cry out to them to come. I want them to come because the battle has already been won, and I have already forgiven their sin, and I will give double to my people. And you know what? I thought this was really cool. In the olden days, if you were indebted, what they did is they brought you in and you would write your debt on a slab, listen to this, of skin. Our sin has been written on Jesus' skin. And what they would do is if you had a debt, you would write it down on the skin and someone else, listen to this, would come and take your debt and say, Rich, I'm going to pay this for you. And he would, they would turn it over, the skin over, and they would write their name on the back of the skin. And they would pay the debt. The debt would be satisfied. The debt would be clear. And they would take the skin and they would nail it to the wall. And that meant that your debt was covered. Jesus did that for you 
and I. That's what it meant to give them double for their sins. That was the word picture. He's saying, I'm sending one that is going to accomplish and your warfare and your hardship shall be over. That doesn't mean you're not going to face some things, but I will mount you up on wings like eagles. You shall walk and not grow weary and run and not faint. I'm going to nail every iniquity. I'm going to nail every sin. I'm going to nail every weakness, every trouble, every Every place where you struggle, I'm going to nail it to the cross and it is going to be signed, sealed and delivered. And I'm going to write my name shall be on you and you are marked for me and you are mine. And I have sealed you for such a time as this. And he said, my glory shall be revealed in my people and they shall see it. God's word is not done. He is not done with you. We want, I want to be like the book of Acts. I want to be like the time of Isaiah when he was saying, God's coming. Uh, hope in God. Trust in God. Believe in God. But their sin got their eyes off of them. Put our eyes back on Jesus. He said, have you not known? That word known means, it means that have you not understood what I have done for you? He says, you need to know something. You need to be certain about something. I am the God who created the heavens and earth. I am the one who has your life in my hands. Have you not heard of me? That doesn't mean with just intelligence. That means have you not heard? That means to hear with your heart and apply it in obedience to your life. Have you not heard of me? See, when you know something and you believe something, you would do it. If you really believed that God would heal you, you would nonstop be praying. If you really believe that God was going to deliver your children, you would nonstop be on top of that thing. God, I believe that you could deliver my children. I believe it. I believe it. And I receive it. God, because when you believe something, you do it. If a, you see a car coming down the road and your child is walking out in the middle of the road and you see it and you believe it, you're going to snatch them out of the road because you don't want them to get hit. If you believe what God says in his word, we need to start walking in obedience and authority and say, God, I know that you can do it. I know that you are able. Have you not seen? Have you not heard that the everlasting Lord, the one who keeps covenant, he's going to come. He's going to come through for you. Amen. God says, that he does not faint, he doesn't get weary of your circumstances. He's not uninterested in your affairs. Look, y'all, I just want to be honest. I was praying for my dog's ear this morning. And y'all could laugh all you want, but you know what? I was like, God, I believe you can hear my dog's ear. And he's not uninterested in my worry, in my affairs. Because do you guys know how much it costs to go to the vet? I'm not even kidding. Last time I went was $450. Ain't nobody got $450 because my dog's ear is hurting when my God can heal his ear. Okay, and God do it so that I can stand up and say, God touched my dog's ear and you're not uninterested in my affairs. Pastor Swagger laid his hands on a car and it started. He's not uninterested in our affairs, even at the smallest things. God wants you to come at all times. He seeks for those who seek him. And he says he will give power to the faint. That means he will give grace. His effectual working of his spirit will give grace to those who are faint of heart. Those who have lost your strength. Naya, if you would come up. I don't know if the battle has been fierce for you. Or maybe you are on a mountaintop, and that's good. But our battle, it doesn't all, we don't always stay on the mountaintop. And I encourage you, if you are in that place, that you surround those that are in the battle. But there's going to be a season of life where you feel like the youth that have fainted and become weary. It says young men should utterly fail because the pressure and the strain of life gets too hard. 
And he says this, but they that wait, those that press, those that persevere, those that believe. And you know what? You can't even do it in your own strength. You can't look. Some of us are real hard-headed. And we could be like, I could do that. I can do anything you can do. That's me. I can do it. My husband be like, you want me to do that for you? No, I can do it. And, but that's what we do with the Lord. I want to do this for you. I can do it. You know what I'm talking about? I want to do this for you, but you got to wait. But I can do it. I get it done now. And then we make a mess of things. If y'all would stand with me. I want to encourage you this morning. If you've been waiting for something, if, and it, you've been growing fatigue in the wait, and you've been growing tired in the wait, remember there's only one of two ways we can go. We can allow the Lord to renew our strength and refresh us and mount us up on those eagle's wings, mount us up above the circumstance, give you power, which is what we want, y'all. That's what we want. We want God to do that. But sometimes, not even realizing it, we have grown bitter and we have grown resentful and we have grown hardened in our hearts maybe towards people or towards the things of God. And God says, I want you to come. I bid you come. Come, I'm crying to you. I'm bidding you to come. Come comfort yourself in my presence. Come comfort yourself in my word. Because my word says, I will renew your strength and I will mount you up and I will cause you to soar. Soar above your circumstance, even though it's still there. But I want you to have my power to overcome. And I will, he said, I will reveal my glory. And I can't wait to the prayers that we prayed for some of y'all and some of the things you've been praying for, we get to see with our eyes. It take place and we see only God could have done that. Only God could have made that happen. Only God could have opened that door. Only God could have gave them that. Only God could have changed that. Only God could have turned that around. Only the Lord could have done that. And you know what? Because they waited and they believed and they trusted their God because he is an everlasting God and he's created the heavens and the earth. Don't you trust the one that created the heavens and the earth who shed his blood for you, who died for you, who, who took that skin and took your sin and nailed it to the cross for you? He said, don't get weary. Allow me to do that work, that twisting, that binding in the waiting and allow me to renew your strength. So is that, if that's you this morning, I encourage you as they play to come up, and let's just ask the Lord God, renew our walk with you, renew our strength, renew the freshness in the church. God, let there be a freshness in our family. Let there be a freshness in our marriage. Let there be a freshness on the job. We've been weary on the job. Let there be a freshness in my life, Lord. I need a touch from you this morning. I need you to move this morning. I have been tired of this thing, God, but I need you to move. If that's you this morning, I invite you to come on up as the worship team worships and we take a moment to praise him.